Gospel reading is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, starting at verse 13. And it can be found very, I think it's page 2 or 3, page 2 in the Pew Bible, in the New Testament. So starting at verse 13. Now, after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Sorry, I just, that's after the wise men had left. After the wise men had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophets, Out of Egypt have I called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated and sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. And there he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I wake suddenly, sweating shivering. Mary looks at me. She knows. Another dream. <clears throat> we pack quickly, go quietly through the streets, middle of the night, off the main road, to the only crossing to a safe land. No soldiers to protect us, no money to bribe, no connections, no supporters, only the Lord. All we know is Herod, want, Herod wants to kill our tiny baby. What harm can our Jesus do? In the houses, the children sleep, oblivious, while we make our escape. They won't be so lucky, Herod thwarted, sends his soldiers to kill every child under two in Bethlehem. <clears throat> when I hear, I feel so guilty. A rich man who builds pagan temples, murders his own family, yet claims to be one of us. An old king of the Jews fears a rival, even a tiny baby, with the same calling. It's politics, dangerous business. I'll tell our son to stay well clear of politics and kings. So we wait in Egypt. In the end, all Herod's powers and privileges can't stop his own death. I say to Jesus, no one lives forever. You have a bloody start to life, my little one. Things never run smooth for you. You're used to trouble, and so are we. But from time to time, I wrestle with problems. And then, as I look at your sleeping body, I feel them slowly melt away. It's as if the spirit within you says, peace, don't worry. Trust in the Lord. Trust me. Heavenly Father, we pray that reading this troubling passage and in troubling times in different ways, 
we would sense the peace of the, our Lord Jesus coming to us. In these difficult words, we would find both the baby Jesus and the Jesus who is the Savior for us and for your world. In his name, amen. So, our passage today is the conclusion of the Christmas story in Matthew, but maybe not the conclusion we would have wanted if we had written the story. Um, this story of uh, fear, a story of a refugee family fleeing from a tyrant who is out to destroy them. Um, we find in this story um, the baby Jesus, the refugee, um, the victim, but I believe we also find the Jesus who is the saviour, the saviour of the world. And I pray that as we look at this passage together, we can find those two themes, the baby Jesus, the refugee baby, and the baby who is the saviour. So the story is of the family fleeing, warmed in a dream, from Herod, who cannot tolerate the idea of another king of the Jews um, when the wise men come seeking a king. And we hear the heart-rending account of the massacre of the innocents, the children of Bethlehem. There's no independent record of this in other history, but it fits with Herod's character um, from other things he is known to have done, um, murdering his own family and assembling the nobles of Jerusalem in the Hippodrome to be killed at the point of his death so that there would be sufficient mourning to accompany it. So Mary and Joseph rightly flee to Egypt as refugees, presumably spending their time looking for work and accommodation as those who flee their homes do. And even after Herod's death, there's still a fear to return to Bethlehem for Joseph. Um, perhaps he fears that rumors of the wonderful events of that Christmas night might still be around and that might get them into trouble um, with Herod's son. And so they settle in Nazareth. So refugees, Jesus as the refugee baby. I don't know if you have seen this statue. Um, Ruth, you could click up on the screen, to, thank you. Um, don't know if anybody knows where this is, is that familiar? Exactly, yeah, this is the statue um, of the commemorating what's known as the Kinder Transport, um, which was the rescue of Jewish children, mostly orphans, um, in the years 1938-1939, as the Nazi net tightened on the Jewish people in Europe, um, about 10,000 children and young people were brought to Britain as refugees um, under the under the. Uh, the inspiration that, that from individuals and also um, sponsored by the British state. It's part of a series of five statues across Europe, um, which I didn't know until I looked for the picture. And there's one more next. This one is in Hamburg. Um, and these commemorate different stages in the refugee journey. So the Liverpool Street one is called Arrival, um, as those refugee children arrived to be um, to be given uh, a place with families in the UK. Um, this one is called, the one in Hamburg is called the final parting. And many of those in Europe are, mark the, the fate as well as those who came to Britain of those who weren't able to make the journey and of the parents of those children. So they're, they're called the final parting, the departure, that's in Danzig. Trains to life, trains to death in Berlin. A channel crossing to life in the Netherlands. Telling the story of refugees. Of course, we have, there are great parallels to that refugee journey, to more recent refugee journeys. Um, 
those fleeing the conflict in Ukraine in the past couple of years. Um, and our age has really continued to be an age of refugees, hasn't it? Those fleeing conflict. Um, we were given a book for Christmas. Um, one of my uncles and aunts likes to give challenging Christmas presents um, <laughs> called uh, The New Odyssey, which is the story of Europe's refugee journey, refugee crisis, sorry. Um, I haven't uh, read it all over the Christmas season, but one of the stories that is highlighted is that of a man called Hashem al-Suki, who's a Syrian, um, who, Syrian, Syrian civil servant who flees to Egypt with his family and then decides that the only thing he can do is leave his family in Egypt and make the Mediterranean crossing in a small boat. He then takes the train to Sweden and applies for asylum to bring his family to join him. And it's the story of his journey, his wait in a small town called Skinskatterberg in Sweden, about 4,000 people, his anxious wait to see whether his asylum um, application has been granted, um, his welcome from local people, but his anxiety as he senses the political uncertainty surrounding um, his application and, and that of other asylum seekers. It does end with his asylum being granted um, and him seeking to bring his family to join him. So refugee stories. Then 2,000 years ago, back at the time of the Second World War, and in our times, powerful stories, and a powerful comparison with Jesus and his family. Perhaps it reminds us of the story of the parable of the sheep and the goats that Jesus told. Um, in Matthew's Gospel later on, Jesus says, um, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Over Christmas, we sang that lovely carol, ring bells, ring, 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 sing choirs, sing, sing, sing. Jesus comes, Jesus comes, who will make him welcome? And the parallels are definitely there, aren't they, of welcoming the stranger. We know there aren't easy political answers in our current situation, particularly when criminal gangs are involved in people trafficking. And yet the call to welcome the stranger as individuals and as a nation is unavoidable. As we welcome the stranger, we welcome our Lord Jesus Christ. And may we do all we can to support those who search for the best way to help in this situation. But there's also another side to this passage, another layer um, that Matthew brings. Um, Matthew's gospel is the only one to feature this story. And Matthew... Um, ladens his stories with lots of quotations from the Old Testament. Um, sometimes it can be feel like he's trying to prove a point, that he is trying to sort of cram in as many Old Testament quotations as he can to kind of prove that this is a genuine story, a genuine work of God. But I think there's more to it than that. I think the people who read Matthew's Gospel would have been their lives would have been laden with these Old Testament stories, and it would have been more than just kind of proof texts for them. All these quotations Matthew makes would have given a rich background to the story for the people who read them, and for us to an extent as we explore the Old Testament links. So one particular link that Matthew makes is this quotation from the, towards the beginning of our story. Matthew says, Out of Egypt have I called my son. And the whole story is about Jesus going to Egypt with his family and then coming back out of Egypt. So why is Matthew doing that? Why is he spending quite a chunk of his gospel on describing this journey to Egypt and back again? Well, we know that Egypt has a big part in the Old Testament, don't we? 
Egypt was the place where God's people were imprisoned as slaves for hundreds of years, um, where they were trapped, but then where they were called out and led out. They were led on a journey as refugees across the desert to the promised land. And what's more, there is a baby in that story, a baby whose life is in danger from a tyrant. Um, Moses, we know, Moses was in danger from Pharaoh. He was hidden where in the bulrushes and kept safe. So Moses, a template perhaps for Jesus, being kept safe in Egypt. But Moses wasn't just a refugee with his people. Moses turned out to be so much more than that, didn't he? Moses was the one who God called to lead his people out of Egypt, to lead the refugee people to safety in the promised land. Moses was the savior or God's, God's actor as a savior for his people, leaving, leading them to security. So Jesus I think Matthew is saying is not just the helpless baby, although that's what he is, but in that helpless baby is a template, is someone who follows the path of Moses, who's going to be a savior for his people to lead them out to safety and security. To lead them out to safety from what, I think, is the question. And for that, we have to look back in Matthew's gospel um, to the previous chapter. What does the angel say to Joseph back in chapter 1 when he tells him about the coming of the baby? You might want to flick back. Chapter 1, verse 21. The angel says, You will name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus the refugee saviour of people from the deepest problem of humankind. In some sense, the experience of being wanderers and refugees, in a sense, is a common human experience to all in that none of us have found our settled states in this life. All of our lives are in some way blighted by the common human problem of sin, of being wanderers, of not having found our home. At times, we're all keenly aware of our need for personal transformation and of the need for the transformation of the world around us. Jesus, a refugee saviour, the one who came to seek the wanderers, to bring them back again. Just as Moses led the people of Israel safely through the wilderness out of Egypt, Matthew is saying that Jesus will lead his people and us to safety. What a wonderful promise. The promise that Jesus will come and live in our hearts. Another carol. Um, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. The refugee saviour, the saviour from sin. And so it seems that these two things are in some way intrinsically linked. Jesus coming as the refugee child, calling us to care for the safe, for the needy, and in the needy to find Jesus, our saviour, but Jesus also coming as the saviour of the world to rescue from sin. Perhaps the turning outwards of our lives towards others, towards the poor, towards the stranger, is part of the coming of our saviour to redeem us. Jesus is turning the world outwards towards others beyond our selfish concerns. He is saving us. May we know the refugee saviour in our lives, inspiring us to care for those around us, friend and stranger, in our families, 
in our church, in our nation, this Christmas time, saving us from the deepest things that spoil our lives and drag us down. Ring bells ring, ring ring, sing choirs, sing, sing, sing. Jesus comes, Jesus comes. We will make him welcome. Amen.